Croito is channeled by fluid. Yes, it's time to go far beyond the world again. And this is my first recording with the brand new mic. I just arrived yesterday. As I mentioned before in a couple of videos, I have some problems with my old one, and this is in large part thanks to all my patrons, especially to my top patrons Tiger Cub, Mr. Beaver 11, Dissonance, Evan King, Grizz, Zamuto, The Beholder, David Taylor, Popot, Anubis Silverwind, Brandon Bradford, and I Dare Corval. It's uh, definitely a big help to have that money coming in when I have to buy something like this because these mics aren't cheap. So thanks everyone. And this video is going to be in two parts. Well, this update, I should say. It's uh, this video and then next week's will continue the story. So I think that's all I really need to say about this. And as Luna comes into view, let's start up this video. I close my eyes and simply drift away into the memory of his warm embrace. The grey wolf fills my dreams, his scent, his kind gaze, and the way his fur feels against my naked skin. Oddly enough, I am aware it's just a wish away, wherever I give in to it completely. Despite him barely leaving, I'm already starved for his presence and his image gives me peace. I spend the night in this sweet surrender until a sudden jolt stirs me up. The world is shaking and I'm bouncing up and down, almost leaping out of bed in complete confusion when everything comes to a halt. Oh good, finally awake! I sit there looking dumbfounded and clutching my chest as the black wolf lets go of the bed frame. What, what the fuck, Vol? For a moment he narrows his eyes at my familiarity, but he sighs to let it slide. I was knocking for a good while. You were sleeping like a rock. Indeed, it might have been one of the calmest nights I've experienced so far. Well, up to this point. I throw my gaze towards the window, only to be met by darkness. It's the middle of the night. Well, just before dawn, actually, and we have work to do. I know Ranaka has a tendency to be a good den mother, but encouraging idleness and sloth is not nurture a strong character. I blink at him in slight annoyance. Sloth, I was sleeping. Well, quite comfortably as well inside your master's bed. When the wolf's away, the wards play. The male scoffs, and I'm not entirely sure if he's teasing anymore. I've been sleeping here for the past week. I notice his brow raised in curiosity, and realise that perhaps I shouldn't have said that. And where was he? Um... On the kitchen floor. He looks back into the other room with clear discomfort, then gives me a rather patronising stare. He shouldn't abuse his hospitality like that. It's his bed and he needs to be rested to perform his duties. I don't think admitting we share the bed would sit well with the black wolf, so I decide to shrug it off. Besides, it's none of his business what sleeping arrangements we have. He insisted. Humph. Anyway, thanks for the gentle wake-up. I mumble ironically, rubbing my sleepy eyes. Well, if you don't hear an intruder enter your bedchamber, be happy it was shaking and stirred you up and not a dagger. I've already met your dagger. I wink at him, giving myself an idle stretch and flopping my arms onto the bed. In. Besides, you're talking to you have to be on edge all the damn time. Or well, maybe not at home, but when camping out there, being vigilant is the only thing that keeps you firmly in the land of the living. Now get up. I'll start the fire. Rannoch made me promise I'll feed you well. As if a butcher would starve a piglet. He mutters, disappearing into the kitchen. I throw off the covers and am immediately met by the extremely chilly morning. Perhaps the coldest one yet. My teeth begin to chatter. Damn this weather. It could make up its mind. What did you expect? It's early spring. I can hear him rustle around, pieces of wood clanking together as he arranges them securely within the hearth. I also need to get you some more firewood. Swing an axe will be a good experience, considering your twigs for arms. I frown, looking over my naked body. I approach the chest and caress the folded dress. I half wonder if it's a good idea for me to wear it. 
One, I don't want to aggravate the male, but two, it would be a shame to saw it in the butchery. I don't put it on, he says appear in the doorway and cause me to wince, half expect another outburst, yet he seems oddly indifferent. It might be yours now, but I still paid for it. But if you ruin it, we'll have to have a little chat. He sneers and pretty much confirms my assumption. Silk dresses are no good at a butchery. It's cold, though. I mumble, looking at him in slight discomfort. Are you going to want a Rannox cloaks like you did before? It'll get warmer when the sun comes out anyway. I nod. In truth, it'll be some comfort having a piece of my wolf around, especially with how testy Vul can be. I join him in the kitchen, seeing the fire already dance merrily. Walk into the cupboard, I find the same old water in the bowl. I open the window and simply toss it outside. I brought your fresh water from the spring. It's in the bucket by the door. The black wolf points it out and I nod in gratitude. Is there a spring nearby? Oh, close enough. He responds indifferently as I lift up the handle. It's quite heavy, but I'm not going to complain in front of him. He'll just call me a weakling again in words of his choice. I'll oh, save some of the jug for cooking and drinking. Rest you can use for wash up. I nod, looking at the task at hand with worry. The bucket isn't big enough to dunk the pitcher in it. And I know I won't be able to lift it high enough without making a huge spill. Suddenly I have an idea. I grab the pitcher and secure it beneath the bucket as I balance it on the edge of the table. That's it. Mind over matter every time. I tilt it gently, allowing the water to spill over the edge right into the jug's opening, while I secure a pan in the fireplace. I place the bucket heavily onto the floor, looking back at the wolf. He's either ignoring me or trying to pretend he's not paying attention, or I immediately recognise the familiar satisfied flickers of his tail. They might have a built-in heart rate monitor, but their tails are instant mood giveaways. I just shake my head and decide to continue with my morning routine. I need to use the privy, if you don't mind. Oh, why would I? He shrugs and I take his approval for me to take my leave. Once I'm back, I can hear the eggs and bacon already sizzling happily on the hot plates I approach the cupboard. I wash up, try not to complain too much about how cold the water is. Despite the outhouse being one of the low points of my stay here, my mood quickly lifts up. The smell of it in the room is so reminiscent of my first breakfast in this house. I dry myself off and sit at the table to be greeted with a single plate. There's two sunny side ups and a large marbled slice of ham. You're not going to eat? I don't break fast until noon. Why's that? I raise my brows he passes me one of yesterday's rolls. I like to work up an appetite. Also the late night feasting keeps you full throughout the night and morning. Makes sense. Doesn't sound healthy, though. He gives me a mocking gaze, spreading his arms, inviting me to inspect his musculature. I said the guy gets sick because of flowers and dust. I shake my head and simply dig in. Vol waits patiently, helping himself to a mug of ale while I finish my meal. I down it as fast as I can, washing it down with a cup of water every now and then. I kind of miss other things. Maybe not sodas, but tea or coffee would be nice. Between the water, wine and ale, there doesn't seem to be much variety. You done dallying? He asks, finished with his drink. Yes. I exhale, swallowing my last gulp and putting the cup down. The wolf then uses what little water was left in the bucket to douse the fire and I put out the candles. I rush to the rack and grab the green cloak. Once it's fastened around my neck, I carefully pick up the dandelion and place it in my pin. Wool only gives me a curious glance, but doesn't inquire further, and I'm glad for it. Really don't feel like explaining this. As we leave the house, the sky slowly fills with teal and pink hues, announcing the incoming sunrise. I don't think I've ever started a day this early. If so, it definitely wasn't a norm. We both hop over the uneven step, with Vol trying to contain an approving smirk. We don't talk on our way towards the village centre, most likely on the account of wolves slowly emerging from their domiciles. I notice smoke already rising from Vither's chimney, and there's an undeniable smell of baked bread spreading across the street. 
I catch a glimpse of the male in his doorway and nod to him respectively, to which he only smiles. As dignified as I try to be, I stumble on a little stone and nearly lose my footing. That's when Vol grabs my arm mid-flight, saving my face from hitting the dirt. The embarrassment is empowered by the bombastic laughter of the brown male reaching me from his house. Despite my mental trip, we don't stop when Vol pulls me forward, interrupting a little massage I was giving to my toes. Walking barefoot's really done a number on my soles. The roads are mostly packed earth with little debris on them, but still my feet ache a little. Considering I've just gotten a silk dress, asking for shoes might sound a bit ungrateful and needy. Moreover, as far as I can see, none of them wears any. I wonder if they even know what shoes are. Why, you're keeping your yapping to a minimum. The black male mutters as we approach his shop and I nod. It's not like I plan on being chatty right in the heart of their village. Especially with the stockades in the field of view. As we enter his shop, I look around, first time seeing the place from the inside. There are two counters on opposite sides, both suited for chopping and cutting meats. Different hooks hang from the ceiling, holding up joints and carcasses of recent kills. It's not exactly an appealing workplace, if I'm to be honest. I know you're a talker, but this area gets quite busy. You can whisper to me while you're facing the back wall. I have good hearing. Just don't open your head hole when facing the town. I give him a bemused look, but nod in agreement. Well, there's plenty of work to do, so have another set of paws will be appreciated. Uh, okay. Right, I've set a workstation for you there. He points to the back wall where the counter is. I'll keep you from drawing too much attention. Speaking of... He grumbles as his ear twitches. He's looking back towards the village centre, and I must admit his hearing is quite impressive. There, though still some distance from us, I notice the familiar wolf guards approach, carrying what looks like a medium-sized boar. Hey there, Volk, I've got a delivery for you. Says the male that kept watch over me. He has a wide smile, but quickly locks his startled gaze with mine. The black wolf inspects the kill as they hold it in their paws, while Dre keeps eyeing me out. I'm more like them brains. A bit to the left and he's ruptured the gallbladder. Sorry, I was trying my hardest. The other wolf snickers, but Vol does not find it amusing and issues a subdued growl. I'll try harder next time. That's when he noticed Dre's invas- invasive gaze. What are you staring at? Uh, no, nothing. The wolf mumbles in response, looking to his friend for help. This one simply turns away. That's what I thought. I get lost. Okay, okay, jeez. I wait until I have a earshot and whisper discreetly. He's Vith's son, isn't he? Aren't those two from Rannoch's pack? Yeah, how did you know? I can add two and two together. I shrug. I thought they'd have gone with him. No, Rannoch left alone. Why? I ask, rather than settle these out there on his own. Well, it's a scouting mission. Rannoch has higher stamina than most. They would only slow him down. Hmm. I frown, but before I can dwell on this, Vol throws me a condescending look. I assume you're squeamish. Yeah, why? Because I'm about to be elbow deep in this boar's guts. He scoffs and I wince uncomfortably. Oh, yeah, that's not my type of thing. Well, fetch me a bucket so you don't have to see it. Okay. I nod and look around. Oh, it's by the door. He points and I quickly grab it. Once I place the bucket at his feet, he reaches up to one of the hooks. Right, this is a hind leg. He huffs as he dismounts a slab of meat and carries it towards the back table. (coughs) The limb drops onto the surface with a loud thud, causing the various metal tools to dance. Here's a knife and a cleaver. He points to the side. I need you to remove all the meat from the bone. I've never done this before. You have two paws, don't you? He scoffs. All you need to do is chop and cut. Doesn't matter if you shred the meat, it's all going to the grinder anyway. He shrugs and walks back to his own station. Okay. I mutter and look at the massive hunk of meat without. 
Without much choice, I simply reach the cleaver and begin hacking at the slab. Despite putting a lot of effort between each swing, I cannot sink the blade deeper than an inch or two. He tries to ignore me for a while, my laboured huffs and grunts finally draw Vol's attention. Seriously, don't you have any muscle? Um... I stretch out my arms. What sort of question is that? I'm all skin and bones. Well, a pup could chop better than that. Yeah. He grumbles, forced me back to face the workbench and taking hold of my wrists. Oh no. I'm getting the Rannock treatment again. He squeezes my wrists much more harshly than the grey wolf would. My attention is drawn to his rigid form pressing against my back. I don't even notice when he pulls my chopping arm high up, and slightly behind I'm getting flushed with embarrassment at his warm seeping through my cloak and skin. What is wrong with me? I'm drawn back to reality as he crushes my wrist, forcing my arm to swing down. With his aid I can hear the blade sink all the way through into the bone. There you go, see? He smirks, pulling away I do not dare to face him. Yeah. I mumble, certain my face is painted red. I continue with my task, hoping that with each chop the workout I put myself through will either extinguish my blush, or at least mask it behind some sweat. Every now and then I can hear some squelch or the sickening sound coming from behind me as Vol guts the ball. I try to stay on my task and keep myself distracted. Despite appearances, hacking at this meat is not as simple as it looks. Ten or twenty chops in and my arm begins to numb and burn. I'm going to regret this come the morrow. Come the morrow? I chuckled to myself. I even started talking like them. A loud crunching noise announces that my blade struck a bone. I struggle with pulling it out. When I finally do, Vol is already standing behind me. Work around the bone as close as you can. You can clear the rest of the meat with a knife. What is this for? I asked, looking back at him with slight confusion. We'll be making sausages. The wolf shrugs and returns back to his workstation. Oh, cool. A brief smile quickly turns into a cringe, as this time there's a loud, long, slushing sound. It's almost as if Vol emptied a bunch of wet pellets into the bucket. When another slush of guts reaches my ears, I simply put down the blade and wince uncomfortably. Yes, such a wimp. The sound was bad enough, but now... Now I feel my innards tying and not the wretched stench of blood and bile that envelops the shop. It's sweet and sickening. It triggers my gag reflex and I barely stop myself from emptying my own stomach. Hey, you vomit into your and will have to scrape you off that wall. The wolf growls and I try to compose myself. Another wave of sweet and festering smell almost pushes me over the edge. Sorry, it's just the... Ugh. Oh God. I burst through the side door, not even looking where I'm going. Taking shelter in the black back room, I rest myself against the wall, away from the stench and gore of the meat shop. Wolves' mocking laughter only empowers the uncomfortable position I found myself in. Ah, quit your whining, I'm nearly done. He calls out, but I do not dare to step outside just yet. I take a few rattle breaths to settle my stomach. Ritzer struggles, my diaphragm seizes up and does not let go, almost as if it turned to stone. Fuck. This is literally the worst day of my life. And I get to say that without being overdramatic. Considering all I can remember is the last seven days, even including being stabbed, this is the worst. I finally feel the cramp stand up and my breathing is less restricted. There's still a large lump stuck inside my throat, but I don't think it's going to go away any time soon. Once I feel the air regain control of my gagging, I slowly step outside. I try to look in phase, but Vol's sniggering leaves no doubt he found my little stunt amusing. The smell of iron still lingers in the air, and worse yet I can now taste it, which is disturbing to say the least. I must draw my willpower to remain strong and grab my cleaver to return to work. I tried to write casual, but it isn't easy. I really need a distraction, so I decide to engage him. Do you like what you do? Ugh. The male grumbles, his amusement suddenly gone. I mean, was this your choice, or...? I hear more yapping than chopping, piglet. He points out in an irritated tone, and I resume my task. Sorry. 
a hack of the meat working around the bone is instructed. I manage a few swings where another slush of guts makes me whimper. My breathing speeds up, which in turn causes me to inhale more of that repugnant stench. I cover my face, trying to calm myself down for I will unleash my own bile all over the place. No, it wasn't my choice. Full breaks of silence, draw my attention away from my nausea. Hardly anything is anyone's choice here, but I learned to enjoy it. You enjoy the gore? I mumble through the hands covering my nose, causing the wolf to scoff. I enjoy the food, stupid. Preparing meat, smoking, roasting. It's extremely satisfying when your job is appreciated, and no one appreciates anything more than a good meal. Yeah, that sounds about right. I try to nod, however this little experience is effectively obliterating my appetite. I really cannot think about food right now, otherwise I will hurl. I'm sure there are other things to appreciate about you. What did I say about that chopping? He cuts me off and I nod hastily, again hacking at the slab in front of me. Eventually the peak of my unease passes as either the smell is carried away by the wind or my nose gets used to it. The next half an hour I keep at detaching large chunks of meat from the leg until I'm left with a fleshy stump that's no longer suitable for the cleaver. Hmm, not bad. Will nods with approval, inspecting my work once he heard the hacking stop. Now get the knife and try to salvage as much as you can. I nod and proceed to do as I'm told, filleting the meat. The blade is extremely sharp and it just glides through the sinew as if it were butter. It really doesn't take long. Eventually I can see white bones shine beneath a thin layer of flesh. Might have been an hour or so since I started. It's hard to believe I managed to butcher an entire hind leg of a boar. But here we are. Will approaches me, wiping his bloodied paws into a cloth he tosses carelessly aside. You left them at the ends. He scrutinises my work, pointing to the joints. It's hard to get the knife around there. Still, pretty good for a first time. I smile at his praise. Should I try some more? Nah, I'm going to boil it down anyway. He weighs his paw at me. For soup? To clean them, you idiot. What do you need clean bones for? To ground them into bone meal. We use it as fertiliser or to make glue. We've got several tanners in the tribe. They require loads of the stuff. Huh. The more you learn. Full lifts a now gutted boar carcass and takes it into the back room. I just stand there in the shop front looking at the disgusting bucket filled with what used to be the beast's innards. Despite my nose getting used to smell, the look of the glistening organs bathed in blood and bile make my own bowels churn. Not to mention all the flies that began to gather to feast on this gore. Once full is back, I look at him pleadingly. What are we going to do with that? Chuck it somewhere? Are you insane? That's still food. He scoffs at me and I shudder. Ew. Why do you think that kidney pie was made out of? It weren't beans, kid. He laughs and despite having a point, I cannot help but notice entrails mixed in there as well. But those are guts. I think we'll use this casing for our sausage. What? Gross. I jump up with a terrible scowl, throwing my gaze away from that grotesque bucket. All I can hear is the wolf's tail giving an energetic swoosh, as Vol issues a rather playful growl. Oh, this is going to be fun. He lifts up the bucket and walks towards the back room. Come. He places it on the table and pulls up a bowl. I try not to look as he rummages through the contents. Every now and then I hear a wet slop of an organ dropping into the separate dish. That should be everything. He nods, looking back to me with his bloody paws. You'll get to sort out the intestines. No, no. I protest as my eyes dilate in terror. Man up, piglet. He scoffs as he walks past me back into the shop. I have a business to run. It's not as hard as it looks. My legs refuse to budge from the spot, but I know I don't have much choice in the matter. I really don't want to look like a stuck-up, and technically Vol is doing me a favour. If I want him to warm up to me, I need to stop acting like a princess. I must draw the courage I can to approach the bucket. Long strands of white ribbons fill the murky water, almost looking like eels. 
the smell forces me to cover my nose once again. This is disgusting. Old Snigger draws my attention as he returns. He grabs one of the knives laid on the table and approaches me. Here, let me show you. I watch as his paw dives into the bucket, retrieving one end of the gut. He pulls it out and presses the blade into it. Well, it's not hard. All you need to do is use the back of the knife. The wolf showcases how he places it against the intestinal wall. As you press and pull, everything comes out on its own on the other end. I watch in discomfort as the contents bloat in the gut move down towards the bottom of the bucket. Your turn. He passes the knife to me and I swallow heavily. I take a moment to finally take hold of the blade. Wolf steps aside and looks at me with an intent gaze. God, I'm going to be sick. I muttered, trying to replicate what he did. Indeed, it's not a hard task, but it has to be one of the most unpleasant things one can do. Especially how the water gets murkier the further along my task I get. And the stench. God, the stench is worse than the sewer. I'm serious, this smells like shit. I protest again, causing the black wolf to laugh. What do you think's inside of it? No, I blurt out in panic. I've been so stunned by this grotesque spectacle, the obviousness of the situation completely eluded me. You lost your damned mind. I snapped, throwing the knife into the bucket with a splash. The wolf raises his brow at me. How old are you? You're acting like a pup. Age has something to do with it. This is absolutely revolting. He gives me a patronising stare, but quickly a sadistic smirk appears on his muzzle. You didn't seem to mind when I brought you the sausage. Oh, no. I stumble back. My end is churning new, so I got punched in my gut and I had to grab my mouth. Covered in the slick gore, the repugnant stench is brought right into my nose, and a real strong gag rocks my body. I wasn't joking. I will kill you if you saw my workshop. Issues another less playful growl. If you need a hurl, do it outside. We're handling food in here, kid. Get a grip. My watery eyes lock with his serious gaze. He's right. I try to contain myself, although it's not an easy task. The wolf throws me a cloth napkin and walks towards the doors. Here, clean yourself up and get back to it. The sooner you do it, the faster you'll be done with it. Have fun fishing for your knife. He winks and disappears into the shop front. I look begrudgingly as he leaves, throwing my defeated gaze into the muddy bucket. I sigh and simply dive in. This has to be the most distasteful task I could ever imagine, but I simply keep at it, pushing the blade and scraping the contents of the gut back into the bucket. Time ceases to matter. Be it five minutes or an hour, it all feels like an eternity. The workshop has become my own, personal, bad place. Once I'm done, I drop the guts back into the dark waters and place the knife onto the table. I'm just standing there like a moron, thinking how I ended up here. This is not how I envisioned my bond in time with the black male. Eventually, Vol checks in on me, walking in with a curious gaze. He picks up the knife and uses it to fish out the gut to pull, up a li- pull it up a little. Uh, not bad. He smiles with approval and looks at me with a proud expression. I don't think I'll be able to eat, like, ever again. I mumble, really unsettled by the entire task. I'll pass. The wolf shrugs and approaches the table. He opens a tap in the canister-looking contraption, allowing him to wash out the bowl he used to separate the innards. Once he closes the tap, he sloshes the water around and then throws it out the back door. Here. Yeah. He passes the bowl to me. You need to wash the guts and cut them into three foot long segments. He looks back at the rancid bucket. Oh, I should give us ten in total. When you're done, fetch me. And once again I'm left alone with my bucket of shit. Peachy. I slowly wish this stab would have finished me off. Seems like mercy compared to this. But no matter how indignant I am or pouty, I know it has to be done. So I pull out the gut, cut it off and drop into the bowl, washing it through. Rinse and repeat until, just as he predicted, I had ten ribbons of innards slushing in clear water. 
I take no time to get rid of that disgusting murky bucket and simply slush the water outside. I don't care what possible use it can have to them, if they've used it for rocket fuel for all I care. Once it's empty, I throw the bucket into the grass and close the door behind me. I wash up my hands on my way to the shop front and stop in the doorway. That's when I notice Verissa on the other side of the counter. Wait, what is he doing here? I'm taking care of him. The male shrugs and I straighten out my cloak. Are you? Yes. He responds indignantly, but only causes the female to raise her brow in disbelief. Of your own free will? Yes. Why? Because he needs looking after. Hmm. Marissa Croon has given me a telling gaze. And what did Rannoch promise you in return? Nothing. I'm doing a favour for a friend. The wolf responds with clear offence in his tone, his body tense and uncomfortably. Hmm. But she's still unconvinced. Not entirely compensates your behaviour the other day, but I guess it is a start. The female finally concedes with a soft smile, and can see Vul's tail give an idle flicker. His posture relaxes, and it's obvious he takes what she thinks and says very personally. Are you okay in there? Rissa draws my attention, and I blink. Do you want me to take you back to the cottage? This would be a perfect opportunity to escape. But considering I've already done the worst part, and I do want to bond with him, so I shake my head. And he's not mistreating you? She darts her gaze between me and Vul, and I can see the male feels put on the spot. His anxious eyes meet with mine. It's clear he worries I could drop him in hot water. But no, he did not mistreat me. Again I shake my head, giving Vul a slight smile, to which he almost sighs with relief. Right, keep your secrets. I have more important things to do. However, if he starts to abuse you, just come straight to me. I'm rather unsettled with the idea of anything, let alone anyone, being in Vol's care. She gives him a teasing gaze, chuckling his bemused expression. I want to pitch in, but before I manage to open my mouth, Vol put, puts a paw on my shoulder. A car is incoming. I lean out and notice the tart strutting the village square as if she owns it. Uh, guess scraping shit out of Wolves Gut wasn't the worst part of my day. Verissa, my sweet, how are you doing? She almost sings in a melodic tone, embrace, embracing the white female. To my surprise, Verissa is quite receptive to this display of affection. Oh, I see you've got that wine stain out all right. Oh, yeah, I took a lot of salt and vinegar. Felt as if I was marinating myself. <laughs> Been there, sister. The tart laughs, but her eyes immediately centre on me. Well, look at here, Rannoch's new ward. Uh, go away. So, how is our little pet doing? He's fine. Well, shrugs indifferently. You know, I felt bad for ignoring him at the feast, but the poor fellow looked completely petrified. I didn't want to add to his plate. Having an entire village dead him down was bad enough. Oh, you could say that again. Oh, no. She's considerate. It's good to see him out and about, though. I must say he's quite an improvement over that ever-frowning bunny. He was giving me the jibbies. Oh yeah, Trist is definitely a work in progress. And she's shit-talking Trist. Why can't I just hate you? Oh, I'm sure now that he got the boot, the chief will break him in no problem. Oh, here's hoping. Her smile widens, and I have to agree. Fuck Trist. Oh, shit, here he comes. How do I look? Suddenly the female readjusts herself, noticing some wolf in the distance. She is pushing her boobs up as they needed to be fuller and takes on a more seductive pose. Oh, you look great. Yep, can't argue with that. Well, I'm missing the main selling point. Oh, you mean Rannoch, to whom's arms you could leap? Wait, what? Oh, indeed. She frowns for a moment, but again tries to look as presentable as possible, taking discreet glances at the strapping male who slowly disappears into the distance. 
Oh, damn. Cora mutters in disappointment. Rannoch really is the lure here. She sighs and looks back to Verissa with a sorrowful gaze. Wait, she using Rannoch as bait to catch the interest of other males? Well, last time worked like a charm. Color would not take his eyes off me the entire following day. I was all he could look at. I still can't believe that none have figured it out yet. Marissa rolls her eyes in amusement, shaking her head slightly, and I got my answer. But she is. You two have been doing this for ages. Can males really be that stupid? And Ranok is in on this? This makes so much sense. Bet she helps him keep other females at bay while he makes her look like a prize to other guys. Sneaky sneaks. Okay, lady. You're not a tart. You're a smart cookie. I doing what? Bull blurts in and I can hardly contain a laugh. And never you mind. Marissa dismisses him and I snort. Seems males can be that stupid. Bull is dead convinced Cora or Anok are an item. I think you just a week and I figured it out. It's not like they're subtle about it either. Anyway, I got to run. The pups are alone without any supervision. Wait, why are you taking care of the pups? Marissa blinks in confusion. Well, the den mother is still not feeling well enough, so I decided to step in. Besides, with the pack gone, it gives me something to do. Anything to keep the mind occupied, eh? Cora's expression falters. It's clear she's hiding in distress. I'm not the only one who picked up on it, and Marissa places a paw on her shoulder reassuringly. Oranik will find out what's going on. Oh, I'm sure he will. I just hope nothing bad has happened. Delorin is very reckless, you know. I kind of feel bad I didn't leave with them. Ah, oh, survivor's guilt. Full scoffs and I widen my eyes. They're not dead. Not confirmed, at least. He shrugs. What the fuck, Vol? Oh, you always know how to brighten the mood. Is it wise to leave that pup in his care? The female looks to me with worry. I was just asking myself the same question. Marissa narrows her eyes and she gives me a very inquisitive gaze. I shudder slightly because I really don't want to be dragged into this. You females are all the same. He's doing fine. If you are that desperate for a pup to coddle, just get yourselves knocked up already. He did not just say that. I gasp just as loud as the females are. Had he not just took the air of our collective lungs, Cora would have noticed, but we're all too stunned. How about I get in and knock your teeth out instead? I can't, I can't understand why Rannoch puts up with you. It's almost beggar's belief. Oh, don't worry, I'm not this boy in your dream, mate. We're not like that. The male sneers. I'm about to grab my head. What are you doing? Seriously gross. Cora grimaces in shock. A good thing the human doesn't understand you, otherwise you'd ruin the pup with your faulty muzzle. I say you'd ruin him by turning the whelp into a flower. Oh my god, well, you really need to get out of your own freaking way. I can see Verissa losing patience again, and now we're behind the closed doors, Rannoch's table would suffer through another bout of abuse. Oh, don't you worry, little guy. Rannoch will be back soon and take you home from that meanie. The tawny female draws my attention to her as she bends over to me slightly with a kind smile. He's a good wolf, like some. She rolls her eyes in Paul's direction. He'll take great care of you. Just don't give him the stink eye. Another tryst jab, confirmed by a wink. I almost let out a chuckle. The female straightens up and looks at Verissa with worry. In all honesty, I hope this one will work out. Actually, they're getting along quite well. Oh, they do. That's great to hear. Cora smiles with relief. And Luna knows that male needs some good company. Talk about a lone wolf. Anyway, see you later at the feast. She nods to me and Verissa, ignoring Vol and rushes off into the village. Bye. Verissa waves back and waits for the girl to make some distance before she faces Vol with a really stern look. We stand like this in uncomfortable silence for a while until the black wolf shrugs in annoyance. What? If I so much as hear a peep from him that you've been mistreating the guy, I will never speak to you again. 
she stated sternly. Understood? You're exaggerating a little bit. Do you understand me? I want to hear you say it. She reiterates through a soft growl. Loud and clear. Good. The female nods and looks to me. You let me know when he crosses the line. I know he's bound to. And with that, she leaves. Damn, that went south fast. Then again, with Vol, it's always the case. I look to him with slight worry and disappointment. I know he's capable of better. He wants to be better. I can see a subtle shift in his expression as his longing eyes follow the departing white female. He's clearly saddened and defeated. Vol, I don't want to talk about it. He states sternly, the moment of weakness gone from his muzzle as he gives me a scornful look. Let's get back to work. I follow him into the back room where he stands in front of the bowl. What now? Now you'll invert and clean them. What? I blink in confusion. I'll show you. Great. I watch as the wolf pushes the bowl into the tank thingy. He readjusts the canister so the tap overhangs the bowl. This part is easy. You grab an intestine and a spindle. The wolf picks up a metal spike with a dull tip and brings it close to one of the gut cuts. Just rub the end until it opens up and slide the spindle in. Now pull the edge over your thumb. He inverts one half of the opening and stretches it over his finger like a balloon. Huh? See? That's how I'll invert it. Oh. You just remove the spindle and slide from the other side, behind your thumb. Now we've created a cuff. He smiles, showing off his handiwork. I'm surprised it doesn't rip. Our guts are incredibly strong. They can take a lot. Now we pull the cuff over the tap and turn it on. The wolf nods and I do as he requested. I watch as the cuff fills with water, bloating the intestine, while Vols just threads it through and allows the weight of the filled up gut to do the work for him. What the hell? See, it is not that bad. Now that it's inverted, just scrape it again with the back of the knife and clean. He showcases, removing the inner lining of the intestine, even a near see through balloon like tube. Fetch me once you do the rest. He stands up and slaps me on my back hard enough to draw air out of my lungs. I look at him with amusement as he leaves to the shop front. I'm fairly certain I have him figured out. Every time something upsets him, he simply burrows himself back into work. I shake my head and decide to simply commit to my task. The first casing is a struggle, but I'm too proud to call him back for a second demonstration. I simply retrace his steps slowly, trying to understand what the hell it is I'm doing. I rub the end until it opens up, slide the spindle, use my thumb to leverage the one side, and push the spindle from underneath. Finally, the cuff resembles what he's done, and once I start pouring water in, the gut bloats like a balloon, threading itself over onto the other side. Huh. As distasteful as this is, I'm incredibly amazed how the hell someone came up with this. It's almost like an art form. Once each inverted gut is scraped with its lining and washed clean in the water, I go back and fetch a black male. He enters the back room, surprised, obviously he did not expect me to be done this soon. Well, well, I'll make a bunch out of you yet. The wolf places a paw over my shoulder. Despite enjoying his praise, I try to play it off cool. You have successfully put me off from meat. It has yet to be seen. He snickers and checks each of the see-through ribbons. You haven't ripped any of them as well, huh? Are we done then? I mumble worriedly and he laughs it off. Oh, stop your whining and come. He waves at me and walks towards one of the barrels. Open up the lid. I nod and do as asked. The moment the lid is off, the room fills with a very acidic odour. Oof, that's a really sour smell. Oh, it's picked in salt. It'll cure them and make them safe to eat. He grabs a pawful of the casings and dunks them in. Once he's done, I put the lid back on and he nods towards a small clay bottle. I bring it to you. We need to wash up. I open the cork and a familiar boozy scent hits my nose. It's moonshine. I realise and he just nods. Yeah, I just drizzle it on my paws. I sprinkle the alcohol and he rubs it in fervently. Seems that work had improved his mood. 
or maybe show me the ropes is more enjoyable than he thought. Whatever the case, I'm glad for it. Once he's done, he grabs the bottle from me and douses my hands in turn. I'm not sure if they know what bacteria are, but I have to admit that I'm impressed by their hygiene. I scrub my arms all the way up to the elbow, just to make sure I didn't leave a spot. Right, go there and turn the wheel. He points to the giant wooden box that I assume was the grinder. The wheel does give some resistance, but eventually it budges, and I can hear all sorts of gears clamour inside. We'll pour some of the moonshine to the top, and it sloshes through the inner workings of the machine. As I continue to turn, the content eventually spill out of the tube in front, meaning the machine got disinfected. He's really diligent with his work. When it's all finished, Vool plugs the bottle and places it back on the table. Let's get the sausages ready. Your meat won't be marinated until tomorrow, but I've got some in stock from yesterday. He lifts up a lid from another barrel, and I can see meat swishing around in herbs and brine. Do you see that metal bowl? The wool points to the side and I locate his query with a nod. Bring it here, douse it with moonshine and slush it out. He watches with approval as I follow the instructions. Once I'm done, he smiles. Right, fill it up with meat and dunk it into the grinder. As I did that, he began plucking garlic from the strands hanging on the wall, along with onions and some other herbs. I observe as he peels the vegetables, but he doesn't chop them. Instead, he breaks the garlic into cloves and simply cuts onions in half. Every two bowls of meat I put into the grinder, he chucks in one halved onion, accompanied with several garlic cloves and a bundle of thyme. I wonder who has time to go easy on the garlic. I shake my head. Once I've finished unloading my tenth bowl, he stops me with a paw. Well, that's enough. He passes me a small wooden box and points to the side shelf. Grab a mortar and grind several of these pellets. Curiously, I glance inside the container and we met by familiar black seeds. Pepper. You do know it then? Oh, perhaps Ranok isn't wrong and... I am a noble, yes. I sigh with amusement. It never gets old. Pepper isn't that uncommon where I come. Quiet. He hushes me as his ear begins to twitch again. Not a moment later we can hear Vith's voice echo from the outside. A Velgo, are you there? Ah, oh, shit. Ah, oh, stay in here. He commands, stepping outside into the, into the shop. I came to get my meat from the week. You're busy. I oh, know, no. no. Uh, what cuts do you need? Ah, uh, just the usual. Give me some chops and ribs if you have any. Oh, and livers and kidneys too. I'll take all you got. All of them? The black wolf sounds confused and Vitha laughs. <laughs> yes, I'll be making pies for the packs in case we have to send them after Rannoch. I don't like the sound of that. Uh, speaking of... His tone shifts slightly. Uh, Cora says your pup's sitting a human. Why would he need to sit in anyway? I can hear a full pause. Obviously he wasn't happy about revealing my presence to the brown male. Well, he doesn't. A dignified task for an alpha like you seems like a waste of your time. Oh, he's quite useful, I can assure you. How do I see the wee bugger? And a long pause, and I'm quite unnerved by Volt's reluctance. After all, I've been in the shop all day. Everyone saw me. Why make an exception with Vitha? Ah, Piglet. He eventually calls out, and I take his cue to step outside. So, oh, what's he doing here? Sweeping floors and staying out of your way? <laughs> the male laughs, but some about his words doesn't sit well with Vol. Oh, on the contrary, he's helping me with work. Oh? The older male blinks, looking at me inquisitively. Is he a butcher, then? Again, Vol lets the words hang, and it doesn't bid well. I oh, know, I'm teaching him the ropes. Ah, so he became your apprentice. Uh, if you say so. Aye, that's quite something, isn't it? I suppose this will add on to his debt, eh? Wait, what? Right, you see wards getting free trade skills during their tenure. Again, if you say so. Vol mutters defeatedly, and I raise I've just gotten busted on something neither has considered. Uh, maybe I should take him into my wing as well. I could use a paw on the bakery. He'd learn another trade, too. Oh, I think butchery's all he can afford. The black wolf pays his emphasis on the last word, and I swallow heavily. Shit, did we both make a mistake by bringing me here? But Vithra is a nice one, isn't he? Uh, considering he's quite a debt already, he can't afford much anyway, eh? The male laughs it off and simply looks at me with a kind of smile. 
Ah, uh, don't worry. I won't let the elders know. But let play off as he were a butcher after all. Not only getting him chained down over a trade skull you forced onto him. Will's expression brightened slightly, and my faith in the brown male got restored. Oh, thank you, Vitha. This really isn't what it looks like. Oh, of course it isn't. The older wolf waves his paw. We all want the other king gone as fast as possible, I'm sure. He looks at the black male with a grin. So, how about my meat? Ah, oh, yes, let me get that ready for you. Will shows me into the back room and I help him fetch different slabs of meat resting on shelves and hooks. As we get Vither's order ready, the black wolf approaches me with a hushed whisper. Well, day is near done here, so we need to think of dinner. Are a steak and onion pie good for you? Sure. I shrug and he nods with satisfaction. Although my appetite for meat is quite low, I'm not going to bitch about it now. We place the slabs on the counter and Vither goes through them one by one. Good, good. These will do nicely. And the livers and kidneys? I'll bring them to you on our way back home. Ah, perfect. He claps his paws and reaches out to a small pouch hanging from his belt. The male places a silver octagonal coin on the counter, pushes it towards Vol, but the black male shakes his head. I'll keep that for now. In turn, you can bake us dinner. Oh? Ritha raises a brow. Uh, what have you in mind? I'll give you a cut of steak. If you can make it into one of your pies, we'll call it even. <laughs> the older male laughs loudly. Pleasure doing business with you, lad. At last, take it. I like to keep my ledger squared. Besides, one won't think you're trying to bribe me. He winks playfully. Just like Wool, I'm not sure I find it amusing. What about our dinner? Making one extra pie is hardly worth a week's supply of meat full. He shakes his head, picking up the entire assortment of cuts. I got quite used to baking for that whelp. Keep an eye on him for me, eh? Well do. The black male nods and picks up the coin, watching Vitha take his leave. I look at it curiously as it's not like any money I've ever seen. What's this? I finally ask once we're free to resume a conversation. Oh, Vitha's token. A token? My bemused expression reveals I don't understand what he's talking about. The male sighs and reaches down beneath the back counter to retrieve a small chest. We don't actually use hard currency within the tribe. We barter with those. He flicks the coin. Each wolf has his own personal set. You give them exchange for services. An IOU. I get it through satisfied realisation. Yeah, you get it. Can you make as many as you like? No, they're made out of true silver and there's always a specific amount. Regular wolves have four, alphas get six, elders have the most, each owning eight tokens. What about the chief? I ask curiously. The chief doesn't need any. The entire tribe works for him. True. I nod. Why do you run for your tokens? And you barter with the ones you have, like this one. He flicks with his coin yet again and then drops it into the chest. Huh. Before you ask what happens when a wolf doesn't have any left, it means he's a shitty wolf who doesn't pull his weight. He shuts the chest and pushes it aside. Ouch. I tease, he's really not the one to mince words. He notices my gaze still drilled into the chest and decides to humour me. Very well, I'll like to have a look. He opens it up once again and rummages through the various coins. There's quite a few in there. Seems like the entire pack owes him. I watch as his paw picks up several round-shaped tokens, which he then places one by one on the counter. They have embossed edges with the full moon in the middle. However, its surface is etched in such a fashion that it appears dark, just as his moonstone. Yeah, those are mine. He states with a smile, and I pick one up to have a closer look. The reverse sports intricate pattern forming his name, Volgo. You have all six, I mutter with amazement. He clearly wants for nothing. Being a butcher means that the wolves need my services more often than I need theirs. Cool. But how do you trade with outsiders? I ask, toying with the tokens. We're gold. He shrugs. We do have foreign coins, and all held in the tribe's treasury. Each wolf has a claim to a share based on their station and contribution. Should we need funds to trade outside, we just request them from the chief. The black wolf pauses, looking intently into the distance if recalling something. The last time I did that was when I bought that dress. 
I even asked for an advance. It took me two years to repay it. He scoffed, scolding his own foolishness. Damn. I mutter uncomfortably. It doesn't allow me to linger on it. Oh, it's yours now. Just keep in mind it didn't come cheap. So don't fuck it up doing something stupid in it. He bobs my t- shoulder teasingly and I smile. Then my eye drifts to a coin lying in the chest and like any other. While the rest is just silver, this one is inlaid with a white stone, a woven paw embossed in the middle of the full moon. He notices that I reach for it and smiles with satisfaction as I rub my own collar. Huh, is this Ranox? I ask needlessly, as the reverse disperses any of my doubts. Yep, your wolf is a big spender. His tokens are always scattered at the four winds. Wolf sniggers and gives me a challenging smirk. Currently on your account. But he does put his weight, I'm sure. I try to brush it off, but it does get me worried. Yeah, he does. It would be a shame if his war didn't. He clearly jabs at this waste of time and I simply flick the coin back in. The wolf collects his tokens and places them securely inside the chest. Once he stashes it away, he simply nods towards me. Let's finish with the sausages. Ugh. We turn into the back room and Vol places a large tub underneath the grinder. He points to the wheel and I take my position. With all the meat inside, the gears give a lot of resistance. I have to take a strong perch with my legs. I strain slightly to get the wheel going. Once it turns, the following rotations require much less force. I can hear the meat and herbs squelch and burp as they go through the cogs. Then sure pinkish mints begin to drop into the tub on the other end. Why are you so nerved with Vitha? Everyone saw me working here. I wasn't unnerved, it was just... He pauses to find a better word, if it mattered. Other wolves won't dare poke into my vares or question what I'm doing. Vitha is the only one who does. It's also one of the wolves that will increase your obligations to the tribe based on circumstances. Which he suggested. I cringe a little. But I don't think he means to do it. But should he say too much to the chief, we could get in serious trouble. Give your wits around him. He's friendly, but too close to the source of power for comfort. I nod in understanding. When all the meat went through, the resistance in the gears lets go entirely and I can turn the wheel freely. It's a signal that we're done, but that's when Vol points to the mortar we abandoned when Vither interrupted us. Crush it as finely as you can. He mutters he douses his hands with moonshine again. The crunching sound of pepper beneath the pestle is quite satisfying. It doesn't take long until all the seeds are turned into a nice powder. Once it's done, the wolf invites me over as he plunges his paws into the mince. Sprinkle it over as I fold it in. The wolf commands and I nod. Observing mix the meat by paw, which is just as well, as there are quite a large concentration of onions and herbs into our loading ratios. It's quite impressive watching his muscle bulge and strain as he works them into an uneven consistency. The smell is nice too, such a stark contrast to my earlier task. Once he's done, he scrapes the meat off his paws and nods towards the bottle. I shake it a little and it's nearly empty. I pour the remaining booze over his paws and he washes them throughout. The wolf then takes a squat and with quite an effort lifts the tub back up, turning the content into the grinder once again. With the contraption filled, he then fixes the nozzle to the front, which reduces the diameter of the feeding tube. I watch as he fills up a bowl with some clear water from the tank and retrieves a bunch of brine casings from the barrel. He runs them off from the excess salt water and simply pulls onto the nozzle. That's when he nods towards the wheel. Again, this time with less effort, I turn it, forcing the grinder to work. The meat makes less noise on its passage, I smile seeing as it squirts into the casings, filling them up and pushing out a decent sized sausage. Every now and then, Vol twists the string, separating it into smaller segments and creating a proper chain. It's quite satisfying seeing how it's made. Once the casing is spent, he stops me from turning the wheel and replaces it with another, while depositing the finished string onto a hook. We continue our work for maybe an hour or so, making in total ten sausage chains. We'll eventually collect them onto a long prong, after admire this lovely curtain of wieners we just made. I'll take them to the smoke room. They'll spend the night there getting ready for tomorrow. I nod and watch the wolf leave. I lean against the table and rest up a bit. My arms hurt a little, especially the upper parts. But not going to lie, having this much work done does feel good. 
Much better than being cooped up in the house, that's for sure. The wolf returns momentarily and wastes no time. He places the meat tub beneath the grinder and walks towards the water tank. He gives it an idle poke to gauge the water levels that resonates loudly. Ah, shall be enough. He takes a bowl and opens the tap, allowing the water to gush freely. Once he fills it up, he points towards the grinder again. I'll pour it through the top and you turn the wheel. Gotta clean the machine. Sure. I smile and rush eagerly to my station. It doesn't take long or much effort. The water slushes out in the tub with different bits and pieces that were stuck inside. I repeat it two more times until the water comes out clear and will simply dispose of it out the back. If you can brush the floors like get Vetter's order ready, we can head back home. Um. I nod and fetch the broom. There's not much to sweep, but I make sure not to leave this place worse than I found it. I reach underneath the table and the grinder, sweeping anything that I can find. Eventually a small heap of dust, onion and garlic peels forms near the door, and I simply push it outside. Once done, I sigh and admire the clean room. Ah, what a crazy day. Ah, piglet! Full calls out, announcing it's time to leave, and I put the broom back. Despite my early statements, I've worked up quite an appetite. I have to admit, for a whiny little bitch, you did quite well today. Again, a backhanded compliment. I've learned by now this is as good as it's going to get. The wolf bends down to pick up the bucket filled with a mixture of dark purple and reddish-brown innards. I wince uncomfortably as he sloshes around as we proceed to leave the shop. You can moan all you like, but these are very nutritious. Maybe. I just hope they won't come in handy. I mutter not because I'm disgusted. To be fair, the pie I had was quite nice. I'm simply worried because Vitter suggested they'll be made into rations for potential search parties should Ranok go missing. The black wolf picks up on my slight shift and he reads me like an open book. He'll be fine. And I don't say this lightly. He continues, trying to reassure me. Ranok is one of the few wolves who don't need help. I narrow my brows. He's a wolf. What is a wolf without his pack? The male blinks and looks at me with slight confusion, as if I accidentally said something profound. He's all alone out there. Well, worrying about it won't help. Should anything go awry? He bumps into my shoulder. I'll go and find him. You're not the only one who cares. I watch as he tugs on his moonstone. He's my moon brother, after all. If anything should happen, I'll traverse the entire world to find him. I smile, feeling quite comforted by the idea. I definitely would not want to be the one in Vol's path should he be on a quest to find a loved one. A with her? The male calls out as we come to a stop in front of the bakery. Vitha steps out of his house with a large pie in his paws. It's still steam as he hands it over to me, and the smell makes my mouth water. I should be cool enough to handle. He winks, facing the black wolf. So, that's all you got? Mmm. Full nods and passes the bucket to the brown male. I suppose it should be enough for a dozen pies if I use some sewage as a filler. That's two packs worth. Indeed, well, hopefully it won't come to that, but who knows? Better be prepared, eh? My heart sings a little at the comment and the black wolf notices it. Full only flashes his brows and shows me slightly. Oh, we better get going. Been a long day. Ah, oh, yes, yes, enjoy! Oh, and Vol, it's nice to see you keep the wealth well, some company. Just keeping an eye on him is required. The black male grumbles, and Vitha laughs in clear disbelief, walking off to his house. As we approach a cottage, the smell of the pie teases my nose, and I have to admit I've worked up quite an appetite. Once at the cabin, Vol pulls my shoulder and causes me to stop. That was a good day's work. Indeed. But before we get settled, let's get your wood restocked. Oh, right. I mumble brutally, not really keen on more chores, but I guess I have to fuel the fire somehow. I jump over the uneven step and approach a porch table to leave the pie there. When I return, Vol has already opened the shed and now picks through the different blocks. Most of it is already cut to size, but I'll get some of the big ones too. He states, chucking out different logs. The wolf retrieves an axe and sets up a wood block on a nearby trunk. Here you go. He passes me the chopper. Um, I don't think I've ever done this before. Did you do anything before? 
He sneers and I roll my eyes. Nothing to it, just swing it like the meat cleaver. I think all that hacking was preparing me to chop wood. I simply sigh and arch myself back to take a wide swing. As the blade sinks into the log, my muscles cramp with a sudden stop. I didn't even get in deep. You don't need to swing that hard. He laughs in amusement. You're going to hurt yourself and then run a copy at my ass. Here. He brushes me aside and takes the axe from me. He just hit it enough to wedge it in. Uncharacteristically to his strength, he just pokes the top of the wood enough to get the blade in an inch or two. Then you just tap and it splits on its own, see? He demonstrates and it looks so effortless. Damn. He passes me the hatchet and lets me try. Indeed, his method requires much less force and is so much easier. I split maybe four or five logs, looking at the slowly growing pile. How many more? I ask uncertainly if I should continue. I'd say it's enough. Shouldn't last you for a day or two. And now that you know your way around the axe, you'll be able to fetch it yourself when needed. I smile and nod in gratitude. He taught me quite a lot, and all in one day. I collect the woods he put the axe away and locks the shed. Once we're ready to go, my stomach makes the most embarrassing rambling sound, causing the wolf to snort. I'm starving. So I hear. When we enter the kitchen, Vol drops the wood near the hearth, while I place the pie onto the table. As he arranges the logs in the niche below, I fetch two tankards and rush towards the barrel. Read in my damn mind, Piglet. The wolf croons, not in approval as I dunk them into the dark liquid. With the week gone, nearly half the thing is emptied. I return the fizzing mugs to the table and get two plates set up. Once full is done, he brushes off his paws and seats himself comfortably, watching as I rustle about. I can't get used to that. No wonder Rannock's so set on you. He snickers, watching as I cut the pie in two and place a half on the plate in front of him. If you act nice, I could even give you a massage. I tease and his ears perk up, getting slightly red on the inside. Humph, he's a touchy one. You keep your paws to yourself. He scoffs and I can't help but chuckle. Both of them are easy to fluster. Now that Varissa made me aware of Rannoch's game, seems you can play it with anyone. We sit like this for a while, me digging into the pie and Vol trying to regain his composure. With someone so tough, it's quite easy to ruffle his fur in the awkward way. Eventually he lets go of his scowl and also joins in the meal. Considering he hasn't eaten since yesterday, I'm surprised he's not ravenous. And devouring the pie with large swigs of the fork. It does hit the spot and pairs excellently with the beer. Here you go, you've earned it. Wolf flicks something across the table. It clanks merrily the entire length until I grab it just before it falls off the edge. What's this? I must have taken a closer look. It's Rannock's token. Once he's back you'll be able to give it to him. Pay off his IOU should you wish. He jests and I furrow my brows. Of course I'll give it back to him. Good pet. Maybe I should get one. He proposes teasingly, but quickly snorts it off. Then again, I don't have debts around to be worked off like your master. Ugh. I walk off to the cupboard and place the coin in one of the drawers. As I return to the table, I notice Vol's tw- tail swaying idly from side to side. Despite almost lethargic movement, it's the most animated I've ever seen it. He clearly enjoyed spending the day together, that's for sure. I take my seat with a hardly contained smile and he notices it, giving me a confused look. What are you grinning at? Oh, nothing. I shake my head, continuing with my share of the pie. I guess he really likes company, just to know how to enjoy it. So, what's your plan for the rest of the day? I ask between each mouthful. Oh, I'll perhaps at you until it's time to head off to the feast. I assume I'm still not welcome there. Oh, it's better you keep to yourself while Rannox has gone. Save her that way. He shrugs, taking an idle sip. Yeah. Also, you need to get some rest. The wolf nods towards the bedroom. I'll be waking you up same time tomorrow. Oh, joy. I snigger and remain silent for a short moment. Full down to a gulp of the ale and checks the bottom of the mug. I might have to refill it for him when he stands up and walks to the barrel himself. I still wonder if having you out and about is a good idea. Even at my shop, the wolves are taking an active interest in you. 
Well, that's what Ranoch wanted, for me to stop being a secret. I mutter, watch him dunk the tankard. The longer I'm kept hidden, the more exotic and fascinating I become. Shove me into the butcher and I blend in with other wards. The wolf scoffs to a smile as he takes his seat again. Oh, I suppose you're right. Size-wise, you do fit in well with the bunnies. He teases and I roll my eyes. Ha ha. But seriously, we need to get you buffed up. His tone shifts a little. If those females had their way, he'd forever remain a flowery twig. I think they're just caring. I am rather fragile. I admit looking at my slender body. There's not an ounce of fat underneath my skin, but also very little muscle. It's almost like I maintained the most healthy but inactive life before waking up here. Very fragile. You can say that again. He smirks in agreement. Hmm. I mumble, picking on my pie. Maybe some working out wouldn't be that bad. My memory might be failing me, but I don't think I used to be this frail. Speaking of females, I don't think you need to give them some slack. Rissa's looking out for me. That's for Cora. I ponder for a moment. Well, she seems quite nice. I wasn't quite sure about her before, but now. She's already spoken for. He throws in randomly as if to squash any notions in my mind. I ran up. I retort mockingly, remembering the comment Verissa made. Oh, why is it funny? I no reason. I shrug. The two of them have been making googly eyes for one another since we were teens. They're obviously into each other. I flash my brows challengingly. They're not the only ones. My voice takes on a teasing tone. What's that supposed to mean? Well, I notice you sneaking long in gazes at Verissa. The wolf's eyes open wide as he's stunned by my forwardness. It's time he tasted his own medicine. She is quite beautiful. I say as if agreeing with his unspoken assessment. I'm not having this conversation with you, Piglet. Wolf subdues a growl, but I brush it off with a chuckle. Why not? I think you should. I don't care what you think. Precisely. I agree, throwing off his train of thought and causing the male to blink. I need to reason with him. We didn't spend the entire day working together not even be able to have an honest conversation. The only other person you could talk to with is Rannoch. You're too worried about his opinion to risk making a fool of yourself. With me, you can talk freely. Ugh, you start to sound like fucking Tano. He sneers, taking a thirsty gulp from his mug. You mean I'm being perceptive? I mean you're being an annoying little prick who sticks his nose in other people's business. His mug clanks against the table as he gives me a rather aggravated gaze. Come on, Vol. We both know you have a crush on her. Then you two could make it work. I see he's struggling to contain a growl, but I don't try to push. We'll never open a proper rapport. You're both duty-bound, honourable and extremely work-oriented. You just need to drop the bad boy act and I'll open up to her a little. What act? He snarls softly, giving me a clear warning. Think I was acting when I put your lights out? Ugh. I sigh in resignation. There's no talking to him, is there? I wonder how Rannoch deals with this. My wolf is extremely patient, though. Perhaps that's the key? I decide not to draw this out longer than it needs to be and just get to the point. Listen, I've spent some time with Arissa. I think I've had enough one-on-ones with her to know what she needs. She's just desperate for some human touch. The scrape of wood echoes across the room as the wolf stands up and slams his paws into the table, giving me a murderous gaze. <laughs> what the fuck is that supposed to mean? I don't even get the blink when the table flies across the room, his paws connect with my throat, shoving me against the back wall. My feet wriggle in panic as the floor disappears from beneath and I'm suspended from his hold. You so much as touched her! What? No! I realise my set would stake a second too late. Slip at the tongue. Well, I cry out desperately. He squeezes my throat tighter. I can hear my heart pounding my head as I'm getting starved for air. Please, it's just an expression. So my vision begins to blur, but his rattled breath slows down. He finally lets me go. I slip out of his paws and drop to the floor like a rag doll. The pounding in my head subsides. Fuck, well, what the hell? I gasp, rubbing my abused neck, which is aching once again on the count of the Black Wolf. You're ready to work on your word choices. 
The male tries to scoff indifferently, but I can see his mortified expression. And you, on your fucking temper! He locks his gaze with his paws, looking at them as they were covered in blood. I'm so confused. I check my own neck to ensure it didn't do any permanent harm. There's no blood, just a bruise. Then she simply shakes his head and clutches his fist. I don't need this shit! He growls and rushes out of the house. Vol, wait, get back here! I try to call out, but he slams the doors behind him. I just sit there, on the floor, gazing over the trashed room and utter defeat. What the hell? It takes me a while to set back the table and clean the kitchen. The ply flew everywhere and it was a nightmare getting out of all the nooks and crannies. My throat still hurts, but I'm not sure what I'm more annoyed with. The fact that he attacked me or they left me to clean up his mess. I guess the only comfort is that I had the dandelion in my pin. Had he been on the table, I doubt it would survive the flight. I touch a flower, trying to get my mood lifted, but to little effect. I'm worried about Rannoch being all alone out there, and Vitha's preparation for the packs being sent after him does not fill me with confidence. Moreover, I doubt I'd be working with Vol tomorrow. Not sure I'd even want to, the wolf won't be showing his muzzle around me any time soon, that's for certain. Which means I'll be left alone to my own devices. Should have listened to Verissa. Even Rannoch thought this was a bad idea. Aside from being angry, the wolf effectively broke his promise. What's even more disappointing is that he failed to do what he wanted to do. To prove he's not a mindless brute. Good going, champ. I feel extremely frustrated. I had so much faith in him. I guess he is a dumb beast after all. Once everything is set back to where it was, I hang up Rannoch's cloak and refill a cup with some water to place my dandelion in. I pet the head of the flower and look around the room. I'm not really hungry anymore nor I'm in the mood to do anything else. The overwhelming feeling of defeat and exhaustion takes hold and I just want to go to sleep. I put out the fire and the lights and simply head to bed. The mattress flops as I land on it and my eyes close automatically. This really was a long fucking day. Within moments the darkness claims me. A gentle hum tries to stir me during my sleep. Perhaps to pull deeper into that old place where one both is and isn't, or maybe back into the land to live in for another stroll. Whatever the reason, I'm too tired to comply. My mind slips away from me and fades out into nothingness. No voice can haunt me tonight. Not tonight. I wake up on my own with a drawn out yawn. I slept without a single disturbance all the way into daylight, as made obvious by the sun saturating the room. Despite having a good night's rest, my arms are sore from all the swinging I did the previous day. My mood is in no great shape either. I still feel rather bitter about how it all ended. As expected, Vol has not come to fetch me. I can only assume he's working alone and fuming, most likely blaming me for what happened. Might be for the best, and like I want to see him any time soon. Slipping up on the vernacular is one thing. I'm not about to ignore the fact he nearly choked me out again. I get out of bed and walk straight into the kitchen. The air is much warmer today. The weather really is going in circles. I take a long, lazy stretch as I pass the table and approach the cupboard. The water is stale and dirty. Rannick was doing so much prep before I woke up. I begin to appreciate everything he did to accommodate me. With an uncomfortable sigh, I take a look towards the bucket. There's no water left. Come to think of it, I don't have any food either. I pick up the remaining two rolls from a few days ago. I tap them against the hearth, hearing an empty knock. Yep, rock hard. It'd be good for making toast, but not much else. Full really left me stranded. I feel anger growing inside me. Such fucking childish behaviour. No, not even childish. Kids don't bash their brains out. He's a monster! He certainly acts like one, that's for sure. But, ugh. I don't want to waste time on this right now. I don't need to be getting angry at that rabid wolf. What I need is food and water. The only way to get either is by going to Verissa. I don't know where the female lives, but surely someone will point me to her. I'm a foreigner, not a mute. If I just say her name, I'll get directions without blowing our cover. I take up the cloak from the hangar and go for my dandelion. Looks just as fresh as the day Rannoch gave it to me. 
about to pick it up when I think about Wolf's attack. On an off chance he's going to wolf handle me again, I'd rather Flower remain safe here. Gently I pat as if saying goodbye, grab the bucket and step outside. The day is extremely bright and warm without a single cloud in the sky. It's quite lovely actually and lifts my spirits somewhat. To my surprise I notice a luna high up in the sky. Then again I'm not sure why I'm surprised. Moon during daytime is not unusual, is it? I jump over the steps and walk onto the path leading towards the village. It's a good few hours after sunrise, so most wolves already got up and went off about their business, meaning the street isn't that crowded. In fact, there's hardly anyone here. My step gains a cheerful gait and I sway my bucket back and forth. It is a lovely morning. However, just before I reach Vithis' shop, I stop dead in my tracks, noticing Tana walking out from around the corner. Fuck. I look for a place to bolt into. Rather, I'm a sitting duck here and the wolf notices me just as fast as I notice him. Ugh, it's the last thing I need. Oh, fancy running to you here. Fancy? I just stepped out of Rank's cottage, you twit. What are you up to? Yes, nonchalantly as he approaches. I give him a dumbfounded look. I'm not going to dance to his tune again. A bucket. Hmm. Could it be you're looking for water? Oh no, I don't want your help. I can show you the way, although it's odd you're left unchaperoned. He looks around as if checking if someone had lost a pet. Once he's satisfied that I wasn't misplaced, he gives me a curious look. Out of nowhere he reaches for me. Before I can swat him away, he takes hold of my chin and tilts my head, revealing the left side of my neck. Oh, what's this? He blinks, his expression shifts to that of genuine confusion. Fuck. You're bruised. I didn't know it was showing. After all, I don't have a mirror. Despite my fears, expression doesn't shift to malice, but rather actual worry. Who did this to you, uh, Rannoch? His voice carries it out. Or was it Vul? Yes, with much clearer conviction. Uh, don't tell me they did it while putting that collar on. What? I blink. I always wanted to shout out no, but mine shall rein myself in. That's why we both chatter in surprise as Kor's melodic call reaches from inside of Vithis' house. Oh, Tano, cutie pie, I knew I heard your voice. Uh, Cora. The male nods to her casually as she comes to a stop and gives me a kind smile. Wait, what is she doing here? Oh, hello, pet. Where might the two of you be headed? Uh, showing the kid where the spring's at. He shrugs, causing the female to look at him with slight disbelief. Uh, kind of odd for you to do that. I thought Rannoch left him in Vull's care. You would think that, uh, wouldn't you? He gives me a telling look. So, uh, what happened? Uh, you tell me, he looks a bit shaken up. The white wolf nods towards me and I shy away, trying to conceal my bruised neck. Oh yeah, he does seem a bit spooked. Thankfully, she does not inquire further and just puffs up her cheeks in anger. Oh, I knew it was a bad idea to leave the pup with that brute. Uh, Rannoch does what Rannoch wills. It has always been so. Tano says dismissively, clearly somewhat bothered by her. Oh, I wish you guys would patch things up already. That little spat is going on for far too long. It's been nearly three years. You're barking at the wrong tree here. He mutters defiantly, a sudden shift in the conversation grabs my attention. Oh, come off it, Tano. You're both equally to blame. The female replies sternly. I wish you'd swallow your damn pride and make up already, the both of you. It's such a shame seeing friendship like that just thrown away. Wait, Tano and Rannoch were friends? Close, it would even seem. Maybe said friendship wasn't all that if it was so easily tossed aside. Honey, you know I love you like a brother, but you can be such a little prick sometimes. Cora says with a caring voice, placing the paw on his shoulder, and I almost snort with laughter. I've known both of you since Puppet. Rannock doesn't turn on others easily. I've tried to set things right. Again, Tano protests with a slight growl. Perhaps you didn't try hard enough. You're the one to talk, both acting like lovebirds. How convenient for him. 
So he's on it as well? Yes, well, it's the last one to the party. Atano, you're behaving like friends were a commodity. You have an ample supply. Do not push it with me. Her attitude shifts slightly, although her voice is still melodic. It carries more of a serious undertone. Tano also notices it and pulls his ears back in deference. Oh, sorry, I would just rather we didn't talk about it. He gives me a reluctant glance. The wolf clearly doesn't want me to hear more than I should. Oh, fine. The female sighs, rolling their eyes and then turning to face me. I don't want to make sure she doesn't notice my bruised throat, readjusting my position and tilting away from her. This does seem to trouble the female, but she does not read further into it. I guess she thinks she's making me uncomfortable. You better get him that spring for the poor, poor thing dies of thirst. She mumbles awkwardly. Uh, yeah. The white wolf pushes me to the side, forcing me to move. As we begin to walk off, she calls out. A botano. I can see a toy with her fingers nervously. Know that I very much don't want to be forced to choose between you two. Not everything has to be a spitting contest. She almost sounds pleading. And for the love of a Luna, do not take out your frustration on this little one. Why would you think? It's beneath you, you hear me? The female interrupts, giving him a stern look. The Tano I know would not endanger others for amusement, nor to get back at someone. Reluctantly, I give the male a worried look. Seems only Varissa has a somewhat good opinion of the male. He notices my gaze and quickly flushes with embarrassment. I, I'm just taking him to the spring. I'm glad to hear it. She nods with a smile, approaching me and ruffling my hair. See you later, Bet. I'm not really sure to make of that exchange, however I'm grateful. Not only did I learn there's more to Tano's and Ranok's hostility, but also Core effectively put an end to any potential schemes the white male cooked up for me. At least for now. I'm still quite wary following him into the woods. He seems oddly defeated and his cocky, gnawing attitude is completely gone. We walk in silence as much as I was thinking of slipping away from him. Curiosity takes over. I'm not a cat, after all. I sneak glances at his troubled expression, but he seems to pay me no mind, clearly buried in thought. We walk maybe five or ten minutes and I can hear the slushing of the nearby creek. We push on through a dense thicket and there it is. It looks enchanting, with crystal clear water meandering between different rocks and pebbles covering the bottom of the brook. There's even a cataract every now and then, with a cascading stream creating tiny rainbows twinkling over the misty spray. I almost gasp out of praise, but catch myself at the very last minute. Ah, here you go. Rannock's house is that way. He points and I take note of the direction. It almost sounds as if he's meaning to leave me here. I wouldn't mind to be fair, he's making me quite uncomfortable. I dunk the bucket into the stream, allowing it to fill up. Pulling it out is a bit of a chore and a struggle, but I manage. Tana gives me inquisitive looks, if gauging if I'm going to get back home. I straighten up and try to show how heavy the bucket really became. As I struggle to walk, the water sloshes from side to side, splattering every other step. Uh, give it here. The male grumbles in annoyance. You'll spill half of it before you even get it there. So much will leave me alone then. But not that I'm complaining, the bucket is pretty freaking heavy. We walk back towards the cottage, again in complete silence. I guess Cora really got underneath his skin. Or perhaps since he clearly knows I can understand them, he's just embarrassed I witnessed the exchange. Whatever the reason, it's quite amusing seeing him so flustered. Even he puts on a mask. In all fairness, smugness and overconfidence do not suit him. Ranok pulls them off, but then again, my wolf isn't a dick about it. As we approach the cabin, my stomach rumbles quite loudly, and I wince in embarrassment once again. Jeez, Frog had gone on, on just a nibbles, but now I'm getting ravenous all of a sudden. Do you have anything to eat? The wolf asks with feigned concern. At least I assume it's feigned, I don't trust his courtesy anymore. I just looked dumbfounded into the scenery, ignoring him completely. Others told me to keep my distance, and even Cora called him out on his shenanigans. It's a simple question. Are you hungry? I reached a long protracted sigh, looking at him with bemusement. I know he suspects, I'm not going to ride him with proof. Ah, uh, come on. 
He walks towards the village and nods for me to follow. Since he's still carrying my water, I don't have much choice. We walk towards Vith's house again, and the male plops the bucket just outside the bakery. Cora, are you still in there? Oh, just a moment. The female responds and takes a while to step out. She wipes her paws into a cloth, smiling wide as she notices the bucket. Wow, I'm impressed. Honesty becomes you. Her eyes turn towards me. Again, I try to shy away to hide my ruse. Your father left any food around? Rolls or pies he wouldn't miss? Wait, she's Vithers' kid? The chief was right. That old wolfie popped them out all over the damn place. Oh, no, he hasn't come back since yesterday. Probably drinking again at the villa. She rolls her eyes in annoyance. I guess those two party hard whenever they can. Oh, why'd you ask? Well, the kid needs some food. Kid? I'm your age, you twerp. Oh, I can help with that. I was making quiches for the pups for later. I could spare one or two. Oh, great, that should keep him going throughout the day. Or let me fetch them. I give Tano a suspicious look, not really sure where this care comes from. He was obviously only paying attention to me at the feast because of Rannoch, but Rannoch's not here. What is your game? You want to butter me up before you shove me into a preheated oven? We wait in silence for the female to come back. She doesn't take long. She rushes out towards me, smiling, and passes two decent-sized quiches with spring onions sprinkled on top. Oh, here you go, love. A tart from a tart. I chuckle immediately, thinking I'll go to hell for that. I shouldn't call her names when she's been nothing but kind towards me. See, you're much better when you're back to your old self. Rannoch would... Can we please stop talking about Rannoch? The male finally snaps. Not everything is about him. Cora only sighs, shaking her head in amusement she returns home. A males. Tano stands there for a while as if thinking something over. Then she picks up the bucket and we walk back towards the cottage. Once there, he plops it at the foot of the steps, and it's just as well, as so I did not intend to invite him in. Rannoch would definitely not be happy if I did. Well, have a good one. Oh, uh, one more thing. He stops mid-turn, tapping his neck. Whatever caused this, there's more where that came from. I narrow my eyes, I'm not sure it's meant to be a threat or a warning. If he implies that Rannoch did it, he's star craving mad. But if he means full then he should probably know. I bet the black male kicked his ass more than once. I stand there fuming and watching the coy wolf walk away. To my surprise, his tail sways from side to side as he suddenly regained his good humour. Is he fucking with me again? Ugh. I put the quiches onto the table and retrieve the bucket from outside. This time around, I decided to be more frugal with water. I use as little as possible to wash up while keeping the rest in the bucket. It's so warm I don't need to fiddle with the fire, so I simply sit back in a chair and enjoy the delightful quiche. It's very hearty and cheesy, with bits of ham and onion in between. Cora's got baking paws, taken after her father, that's for sure. She's also good-looking and well-mannered. Come to think of it, Rhea is quite handsome as well. Apples really do not fall far from the tree. Some people have it all. Then again, it feels like everyone in this tribe is hot. So maybe it's just not Vithas' loins that spawn golden offspring. As my bored and pointless musings begin to drag on, I look around for something to kill time with. I'm fairly certain I'll be left my own devices unless I fetch Verissa. I'd rather not face the female while sporting a massive bruise. That would cause another shit show, and I've seen far too many as of late. Reluctantly, I stand up and walk up towards the cupboard. I remember the title mentioned Six Tribes. Now in more context, I'm sure it speaks of the wolves. I locate it immediately and fetch it back to the table. The volume is quite impressive, with beautiful decorated pages and very intricate writing. The Six Tribes of Tiernan. Just as I remembered. The table of contents shows the book divides into six sections, each dedicated to one tribe. The tribes are as follows. Tiernan, Brasilian, Guldiran, Arden, Lothian and Anwin. Sounds like an introduction to the Lord of the Rings. The boring edition. Wait, wasn't there like an accompanying textbook that very few people read? Silver Million or something among those lines? Yeah. Those things I remember make me feel like I'm reliving my very own freaking fairy tale. 
I even have a prince. Albeit I realise he's not as well situated as they usually are, given his domain consists of this very rustic cottage. Although charming, it's more fitting for the seven dwarfs. I chuckle and return to my reed. Tiernan, along with the Priscillian, compose the heart of the forest. They also share a majestic lake between them called Tremelin. Apparently it's a breathtaking stretch of water, and the description almost makes me wish for a visit there. It's a favourite summer spot for local wolves, perhaps have been playing in the shallows for generations, while others lounge around the beaches. A lake in the woods does seem like a perfect holiday spot, not going to lie. According to tradition, the lake itself is enchanted, and its waters have healing powers thanks to a fae residing within its depths. I smile, realising these wolves, as fantastical as they seem, have legends of their own to share. Thanks to deep familial ties and shared folklore, Tienan and Brazilian were allied for many centuries. It would seem that the militarised way of life those wolves enjoy is driven from a millennia-old tradition of warfare. Whenever they're not fighting others, they fight amongst themselves. Another ally of Tienan, although less faithful and much younger, seems to be Arden, also called the High Forest. It's inhabited by the oldest and tallest trees, reaching all the way back to the use of Sylvan. The wolves living there take deep pride in their ancient heritage and are extremely protective of their woods. Considering what happened to the Tiger Noble, I wonder that that extreme protectiveness entails. Can't be more extreme than killing someone over a graffiti. Gul'duran is the northernmost reach of the woods. The wolves there are strong and industrious and have a reputation for warmongering. Given the militant nature of Tiernan wolves, again I wonder what that means. The book does not keep me hanging. Turns out it means that Gul'duran was an instigator of nearly half of all wars, within and without these woods. Lothian stretches the mountain range hidden deep within the forest, with the highest peak called Amon Silva. That's where the respective tribe takes its residence. According to the book, Lothian flip-flopped during many conflicts, changing sides often more than once depending on the current winner. Pragmatic, but frowned upon by the remaining tribes for a lack of loyalty. Guess Ranek was right about being a wolf in virtue, which in a mixed bag of goods is definitely a redeeming gem of equality. Last place, called Deep Forest, is Anwin. It describes a trove of the most beautiful of groves and meadows, filled with bounty and joy. Wolves of Anwin surprisingly value peace and merriment, rarely if ever participating in conflicts started by the other tribes. Despite the book trying to paint them as debauched and decadent, I see them as quite opposite. Especially since the description frowns upon Anwin's openness to trade with the outsiders. Had it not been for Rannoch, I would have wondered why I haven't ended up in that forest instead. I chuckle, but my amusement doesn't last long. The more pages I flick through, the more details I stumble upon I would be better left without. Despite dates and names meaning nothing to me, I can make a general sense of decades upon decades of systemic warfare. The tribes either banded together to raid and pillage other kin in nearby realms, or if such consensus could not be reached, raided each other. The book glorifies one hero after another, describing how many burrows they put to the claw, how many enemies they'd slain under their paws. It became increasingly uncomfortable, especially since most of the targets were the other kin, specifically of the Sylvan variety. I really hope this is just a history book, and the current affairs are much different. I'm thrown off by a sudden knock to the door. <laughs>